Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Spider-Man Miles Morales. So we were reminiscing in the last part, and now it's time to get the new form of show on the road, it seems. So it's not back to reality. Where does he put his cell phone if he doesn't have pockets? Up his ass. I will say that that flashback was a lot more was a lot more like unintrusive than the non Spider-Man sections in the previous game. I mean, it was that really is very true. Yes, it was really just a bit of story and one simple puzzle. <laughs> Graceful is always Miles. <laughs> I like how there's this whole really badass looking neon lit techno gang going and their leader is called the Tinkerer. Okay. <laughs> I think because like the Mauve Adventure was already taken or some other shit like that. Well, I, I get the feeling that um, the Tinkerer in the comics was probably less of a badass looking threat and more of a, you know, Tinkerer. Um, let's take a look here. Wasn't it like some old, some old white dude in the in the comics? It like in one of fucking universe. Well, the the first thing that pops up is is all the stuff from the new game. So you know. Um, yeah. Uh, father of Rick. Yeah, he's like an old white guy. Um. <laughs> oh, his name was Phineas Mason, though. So they did. Um, like. <laughs> try to keep his original name in a clever way so that's cool um okay let's see well but, but, but like what did his super villain persona look like uh, uh literally just like an, a bald old guy <laughs> i mean uh, like yeah i think like it, it, the threat was more what he made not him specifically so no costume or anything no costume. Yeah, I'm not really seeing any. Because every like every image I've seen is just it's just him with a f like some specs He's and that's it. He's got a it. big head. Yeah. Uh, the terrible and some thick ass eyebrows. The terrible tinkerer. I love fucking old comic covers that are terrible for. Oop, I'm dropping shit. Uh, terrible for actually getting your attention because it's like a block of text. It's like, oh yeah, this strange phone is chiefly to be remembered because of the fact that he has been the first and only alien menace Spider-Man has ever fought. Little did the amazing teen dash ager dream as he ventured into the Tinkerer's gloomy shop that the fate of his entire planet hung upon Spider-Man's victory against almost hopeless odds. Wow. Um, the language is so flowery. Like, that's one of my favorite things about like going back to like to get to mention again 60s batman like every other sentence is like an alliteration or pun or wordplay like i'm all for it i'm not <laughs> it has a certain charm to it no it that doesn't. i would i think it does so kiss my ass <laughs> it's like it's not something that i would want to read like a no book of, it, it's, it, it's a it's a better listening uh, yeah it, it, it's a pain in the ass to read it's like you, uh, you have to an, uh, imagine it with one of those like old-timey 60s radio style announcers, radio yeah. announcers yeah it's also something that i think reads better on an issue to issue basis where you read this um you know every once in a blue moon like at the grocery store um versus like you're reading the full thing the whole time you know that's a little Ugh. bit less um I can barely go farther back than the early 90s and 80s, maybe, as far as old comics go. And even that's a bit cringe for me. Because, like, setting aside the fact that for some, for, for, for some, for some reason I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to understand, all old comics had just the most washed out fucking colors. Um, oh, no, that's... that's <laughs> That's that's very easy to understand. Ink is expensive. Yeah, that's the whole reason. Like, but the, but like at the end of the day, like years far removed from when they're released, it's hard for me to go back to anything like past the like, it's earlier than the uh, the nineties and stuff because I, I I just think panel to panel these comics look fucking dull. Yeah, but the thing that the thing that gets me is actually just the way the dialogue is written. Um, you hmm. know how like every fucking other word is in bold italics because they didn't 
know how to moderate their text emphasis and just let the tone of the dialogue itself, you know, speak for itself. It's very <laughs> rare to find older stuff where they people feel like they talk naturally. Or maybe it's, you know, maybe this is closer to how people actually talked around their time. You know, maybe back no, in the 60s no, people no, no. did talk like that, but I highly doubt it. It's it, it's 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 this it's this it's for the same reason that old timey um old timey advertisements would use quotation marks as a form of emphasis, whereas today we um we we see sar- we see, we see quotation marks more as a as a note as an as a as a sarcasm element. But then there are occasionally still or quoting someone specifically or quoting someone, yes. But like when someone yeah. just quotes one particular word in the middle of a sentence, it's usually meant to signify sarcastic emphasis rather than just general emphasis. Yeah. Because um, otherwise, you just fucking like you either make it all caps or just bolt it. Yeah. Well, italics is generally the way you emphasize things in modern text. Yeah. But it's like there was no. There was no unification between how text was supposed to be written in different mediums, you know? There's also a very big element of tell, don't show in many of these old things where it'll be like, the Fantastic Four face their most terrifying foe yet. Behold Galactus, who blah, blah, blah. And they just build up how scary this person is by telling you that he's supposed to be very scary, you know? <laughs> Versus sh- showing you that Well, he's there is that, but I think by the time the 80s comics that I'm talking about rolled around, that was less of an issue. Um, that sounds more of a Silver Age kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, no, not allowed. <laughs> the... The, um... What I'm talking about is just generally the way dialogue is written. And the way it's written just clashes with my brain because I'm used to reading the tone of punctuation in a specific kind of way that um, I just, when I try to go back and read old 80s, 80s comics and stuff, the way the characters talk feels so cheesy and fake when it hits my brain. Uh, I felt that the way of the most with um, well, uh, the, uh, an immediate example I can think of is Kingdom Come, the Ala, the the one with uh, the Alex Ross illustrations, um, because it is sort of like a reflective of a of a mature older Justice League that was likely like at its peak in the Silver Age. The language comes off as pretty overly sophisticated. Actually, you know what's a good example? Silver Surfer. Uh, Silver Surfer issue one in its original run is damn near incomprehensible because of how overly Shakespearean the language is. That's hmm, interesting. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find an example of you it. You know, I'm not even talking about the language. I'm just talking about the way the text is written and presented on the page. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure if you're just getting at that or just whether or not you can also just comprehend what the fuck they're talking about. Look, when about. someone says an ordinary sentence and there's bold italics for otherwise, like, tame language, <laughs> like, there's no reason for it to be bold italics other than the fact that the comics in that in that particular era thought they had to write bold italics for every minor fluctuation in verbal, in verbal tone that they could think of. Um... Every sentence or every other sentence had bold italics somewhere in it, you know, and um, it my brain is conditioned to read italics on its own as a strong emphasis. It is conditioned to read bold italics as a really strong emphasis. So when every other word that a character speaks has has been written in such a way that you're supposed to see it as strong emphasis, it makes it sound like everyone is doing a really strong William Shatner imp- impersonation. Um. Yeah, you need... <laughs> so if you read a modern story, there's not a lot of that kind of italicist emphasis. Um, emphasis. Uh, like, yeah. really at all. You see it, like, maybe once a chapter, if that, if a author's being particularly liberal with them. Um, 
you really um, only tend to see it every once in a while. Maybe slightly more in something like fantasy, where they'll often um, they'll often have like a specific word or whatever be italicized for for whatever reason. Um, but it's very rare to see it in modern uh, writing. Um, so that's makes it. Uh, it's like it's like using a little bit of salt. It's like if you sprinkle a tiny bit here and a tiny bit there sparingly, works wonders. But if it's everywhere, then that's all you see. You part know? part of the reason is that back in the day, text and comics used to be handwritten, um, whereas nowadays it's all digitally typed in. You know, the, well, there are still letterers, but um, I'm sure, but it's not like it's not handwritten the same way it was in the '60s, for sure. Well, yeah, um, it's the, the the base of the text is written is written digitally first at the very least, and there's it, it makes it easy to format. On top of that, because printed novels and short stories have been around for so long and are done in word processing files primarily now, it's very very easy to format them just right to get the exact punctuation tone that you want S and and everyone is writing for people who have been reading novels short stories and that sort of thing so every there's there's a uniformity to the way text is formatted now and that carries over into comics that did not that did not happen before in the 80s and so comics had their own formatting norms that were separate from novel formatting norms, that were separate from comic strip formatting norms, that were separate from advertising formatting norms. Everything did its own thing as far as text formatting was concerned. So you were supposed to read different things in different ways, and it it was honestly kind of confusing. I don't know how people lived that way. <laughs> well, it, it's funny that you bring that up, because in the really old, like, 60s comics, the artist and the writer even didn't exactly give each other like clear instructions on how things were supposed to go. Um, the, a famous example is um, with Spider-Man. Um, the way that old comics did uh, went was uh, the writer. So Stan, Stan Lee would write out an outline for how he wanted the basic story to go. And then the artist um, who in Spider-Man's case was, I believe Steve Ditko, um, would then draw out all of the comic panels as you see them in the final um, comic. And then the uh, it would go back to the original writer and uh, they would write in like all the dialogue in the balloons and whatnot. Yeah. So there's a very famous case in an early issue of Spider-Man where um, Spider-Man's swinging past a, um, a strike. And uh, Steve Ditko thought that Spider-Man was supposed to be like, ah, oh, these damn strikers, go back to your jobs. Um, and so you see Spider-Man shaking his fist while he's swinging past the strikers. And then Stan Lee sees this image and he's like, oh, he's cheering the strikers on. And so the actual dialogue is just like, wow, these guys are sure being uh, overworked. I hope that they get what they're asking for soon or something like that. So it's just very funny. Um, you know, <laughs> how, like, so much of this has changed since, yeah. since going on. Like, now, it also goes to show, like, how quickly and cheaply comics were originally written as well. Like, they didn't yeah. give a fuck. <laughs> now, nowadays, <laughs> the, the process is a lot more involved. The, the actual writing of the comic would involve basically a storyboard alongside all of the dialogue. And... Uh, the details would be filled in later, but you would essentially have, you know, a rough but complete comic in the in, in the draft in a, in draft form before you actually got to the point of writing the, of, of drawing the real comic. And you know, it's just it feel going back to old comics. It does feel very slapdash. Um, yeah, this was something that I felt when I was trying to read the Archie Sonic comics. Like, I started with the really, really old ones. Ugh. They have a very 60s comic feel, even though they were written in the 90s. Um, <laughs> they kind of uh, do, yeah. Did you did you notice how in one issue, uh, Eggman's base is the 
imposing egg fortress from Sad Am, and then the next issue it goes back to being a cartoon billboard factory or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I've read it, but I uh, wouldn't be surprised. It happens a lot in those first handful of volumes because they were all done by different people, and some of the, and some of the issues were written out of order, so you'll have issues that adhere to the Sadam cartoon design for things, and then you'll have issues that look like they they were like a prototype for Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, but even more cartoony. Was the comic written first? I think they were written at around the same time, but the comic definitely the, same the, time. The, the comic definitely came out earlier, which is why in some of the issues, um, in in the earliest issues in particular, uh, uh, Sally has her pilot design rather than her final design. You know, the pink squirrel with the with the black hair and one with no uh, black hair, and no vest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she sticks with that design for a little while, whereas in Sad Am, the only episode where she has that design is the actual pilot episode, um, which is also the only episode with real badniks in it, now that I think about it. Um, the Buzz Bombers were actually in Sad Am at one point. It was it, It's very bizarre. Really? So like, they had it for the pilot. It was like, all right, swap bots from, <laughs> from here on out. <laughs> this is exhausting. Well, the thing is, the, the, the pilot episode did have swap bots in it, too. But it also had Buzz Bombers and Cluck the Chicken. I think made his made his debut in that too. Although I think Cluck remained in the in the actual show so that Robotnik could do his Doctor Claw thing. Um, but it was wild. That show was great, <laughs> even today. Okay. Oh, jeez. Nope, shit, shit's about to go foobar. <laughs> oh, gosh darn it. Maybe if you hadn't been fighting all the goons for so long, Miles, you could have gotten here sooner. Yeah, they were also, like, gonna hurt people, so you know. Okay. <laughs> Prowler's redeeming himself. See, he's going to help like a good guy. Which means he's going to die. <laughs> he's right. Don't. Okay. We'll get people clear. All right, this makes sense. Send the really fast, really powerful superhero to go actually deal with a threat. And let the... What, does the mom know that uh, Prowler is... Yeah, she knows. Aaron? Okay. Yeah, I get the feeling the adults would know. Oh. oh! Ooh! <laughs> so much for the dramatic entry, Miles. I have Rock'em Sock'em robot hands. What made you think you stood a chance? I have anchor arms. I'm a jerk, and everyone <laughs> loves me. Everyone hates you. No! <laughs> and they just blow up. <laughs> when did he lie to her the first time? She's just about wanting to join the underground, but she's just angry. She's just like she's gone and gotten herself into an emotional head of steam, and it's not going away. You're too late. Ah, well. If only there was a way to just fuck up this <laughs> fuck one you. building in particular. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's what she thinks she's doing. She thinks Spider-Man is lying when she, when he says that the reactor will do more than that. Although, to be honest, just fucking up this one building would be a bit much by itself and would probably lead to other civilian casualties. I can't let you stop me. Okay. Dramatic. Round one. <laughs> Is it the final boss? No, wait, no, it's yeah, not. Yeah, because... round, round one of the final boss. Oh, okay. Are so they... yeah, enhanced, enhanced Moog that has all the powers of all the regular Moogs. Oh, she's got the freaking Sword of the Creator here. <laughs> yeah. I need to play Fire Emblem Three Houses again. 
Which route? Uh, I don't know. Probably Black Eagles again, because I hate change. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I feel that. I feel like you're playing a game that makes you comfortable, but Jesus Christ. I still haven't <laughs> finished Blue Lions and Golden Deer. I mean, I've started playthroughs of both. Um, and I haven't even gotten anywhere near actually playing Silver Snow. I mean, you would think that I would have accidentally bumbled into Silver Snow first, like a normal player would. But I Is actually Silver played Snow the, the people that they have living in the basement? No, Silver Snow is... It, if you play Black Eagles and end up siding with the church, it's Silver Snow. Um, Crimson Flower is the second Black Eagles route where you wind up siding against the church. But it's easy to miss because you need to actually be talking to the NPCs in the, in the, uh, in the monastery in order to uh, find the thing that will get you onto the correct route. Dun, dun, dun. See you next Explosion. part. Explosion. <laughs>